So that's the old box, playing on both. So it does work. Um, so a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, tell you what it is, motivations for working on it, uh, some hardware and software details, uh, a kind of a, a review of open hardware stuff that I'm, I've been involved with and that this project has, has showed up, um, and then some details of the open source tools uh, that we use to do the hardware and software. So you can see the odd box on the on the right there. It's um, it's an open hardware music player or recorder. You can see the two jacks, three and a half mil jacks coming out the top there. One's a line in, one's a line out. Um, it uses uh, an ARM Cortex microcontroller um, and an SD card for storage and a, a separate hardware codec chip. So I'm not doing the OG decoding in my software, it's, it's a hardware device which saves battery and programming time. Um, the, so the firmware for it is all open source and the board designs and all this kind of thing. Um, and it's all hand assembled, so it's, it's a bit more tricky than, than a through hole kind of Arduino type project would be, but you can still build it in a spare room. So what was the motivation for making a, an open source hardware player? Um, it's quite a broad project, so it's interesting to me in that I enjoy electronics and programming, so it's got elements of all that, and uh, particularly I enjoy the low level stuff, so I've, I've been working on kind of B-tree database structures to, you know, um, SPI data, you know, buses and, and file system software and all that kind of stuff all the way through. So it's got all sorts of stuff and it's kind of down on the down in a microcontroller. Um, I wanted a more hackable platform. I always want more features in, in the devices that I own. And I'm terrible for reading documentation. So in a lot of cases, I'd rather create something that I can contain entirely with my head and understand that's simpler than having, say, um, an old Android phone or something and then hacking a, a new app onto it would rather you know, understand the whole system. Um, and another feature is that it was, it's it taken a while to create this project. I started it three or four years ago, um, quite a few years ago. Um, at the time, the only Android phone on the market was the, the original G1. It was £35 a month. And even though this has been quite an expensive project to get going, it's only two or three months worth of uh, a fly on that phone. Um, and there wasn't, the, there weren't the range of kind of smartphone devices and stuff that are around now. I mean, obviously, my phone play on at the time, um, I couldn't get an MP3 player that would play on, except a couple of, I tried a couple of cheap Chinese uh, imports which would play OG files but they had almost eight pixels across on the screen and it kind of only told you the file name and you couldn't do artist and album browsing and all this kind of stuff. Um, so an alternative approach might be something like uh, an iPod with Rockbox on it, which is quite a popular way to do it, um, but I decided to go from scratch and design it myself. Uh, so it was my own desire to create something rather than necessarily a a market opening or something that I thought should be done. So what's the, the hardware overview view? Um, you can almost see that this is the microcontroller chip here which does all the uh, screen control and the, the SD card and the, the central control of the system uh, next to the, the screen connector which are both um, half millimeter pitch devices to give you an idea of scale. So this is a standard 0.1 inch pitch here, and you can see the much finer pins, but that's, that's kind of the scale that you have to work to get into parts. Um, so it's an ARM Cortex-M3 microcontroller, it's the STM32. Uh, if any of you have come across the Leaf Labs Maple, which is an Arduino compatible um, ARM-based board, it's that chip. Um, 
it's been used in quite a lot of open projects for various things. The, the DSO nano uh, scope that you can get is uh, based on that chip. The VS1053, the codec chip, uh, is the brains behind the audio decoding. It can take an AUG or uh, WAV feed and decode it. 1053 also does proprietary codecs, but <coughs> if you're selling a device with it in, you have to then pay for an offer Microsoft, uh, whoever it is who owns the AAC patents, licensing. The 8053 only supports OG Vorbis, uh, FLAC and WAV, so there's no licensing on any, uh, any of the codecs. Um, it's got a 128x64 graphic LCD, SD card for storage, um, the, the LiPo battery I'm planning to use is a replacement iPod battery, which I picked up in Mapping, very cheap. It's got all the protection and stuff on board, so any, any lithium polymer 3.7 volt cell that you've got, an old phone or anything will do. Um, it's got a micro USB charging socket at the bottom, so any charger from uh, most modern Android phones or Kindle or anything will just plug in and charge it. Um, and it's got the switches that you saw on the front um, for kind of user interface. So the software, it's all written in vanilla C. There's no C++, there's no uh, other kind of languages or assembly code or anything. It's all C. Um, it runs... Uh, it runs in... It, it uses the hardware interrupts. There's no real-time operating system or anything on it. It uses the hardware interrupts to trigger events. Um, something I, I need to tweak a bit because they're conflicting on file system calls at the moment. But um, so you can, in the main loop software that you're running on it, which is where the UI is controlled and stuff, you can do things like play file, give it a file name, and it will play that file from the SD card, and it will immediately return to your main loop. So you can then do something like, currently it goes into a, a loop just updating the display to tell you the progress, how far it's got. Because um, the, the file playing is done in the background using, using task switching on the hardware interface. Um, I've written basic screen driving routines. The SD card file IO is pretty much there. I found a massive bug in the seek routine. It uses uh, newlib, which is a C library, and it has system calls. So read, write, seek, open, and close uh, all fall back through to my code. So you can use the standard F open, F read, F write, C calls. And then when it gets to something that it just can't do because it's hardware specific, like writing the standard out, falls back to my code and my code looks at the SD card and writes to the UART or all this kind of thing. Um, so it supports FAT16 and 32 at the moment with no long file names. So there's no patents in there either. Um, so it's doing file playback progress at the moment. It can size up old tracks uh, very quickly and, and then give you a progress of how far through it's got in playback. Um, it's got some OG metadata uh, handling, which is currently incomplete, but it can basically strip out the artist and album and track and all this kind of stuff. Um, and the track database is under construction still. Uh, it's quite a challenge writing a, a B tree database structure, which can reside within a chip that's only got 20k of RAM. So um, it's using a lot of block allocation on the SD card, and then just as being minimal indexes in, in the 20k of RAM um, to do artist and, and album lookup. So it should have a kind of iPod-esque um, search by artist and, and album and alphabetical listing of the tracks rather than just a file system lookup like you see on the cheap Chinese imports. So some observations about the open hardware and, and what's involved. Um, I've used all open source tools as well as making the, the final product open source. So it doesn't use Eagle and, and proprietary software that's quite prevalent. It's using KitKat, which is fully open source. Um, and it's, it's brilliant, professional quality, not just this project. Um, 
since I've been using it for this project, I've recommended it to several people. My dad's company is actually selling thousand pound, thousands of pounds worth of products which have been designed in KiCad and been professionally made and auto placed and things. And they, all of the gen, all of the part placement, board cutting, whole assembly files to do it all has been generated with open source software, and it's really ready for for mainstream um, hardware assembly work. Um, so I've I've been keeping track of some of the, the open hardware stuff while I've been doing this and the guidelines are kind of settling down on what is considered open hardware. So you've got to release board files, you've got to have schematics. The the open source hardware movement is quite keen on the um, on excluding any um, non-commercial part of the license. It's like GPL. If you've got GPL software, you can use it in a commercial environment. Obviously, you can't sell the code. Um, you can't restrict access to the code um, to non-commercial only. And that's the same with the licensing for board files and things. You can't use Creative Commons non-commercial, I call it open hardware, because then it's not open for anyone to use. Um, so uh, with the increase in using KiCad in the last year or so, it's been increasingly easy to share open hardware designs with everyone else in a way that they can edit it, even if it's bigger and more complicated than free versions of, say, Eagle, which has been very popular, will allow. Um, and you can do what is fairly complex project like this on on the cost of the parts, really, without having to outlay hundreds of pounds a year for, for the design software and things, which was the case not many years ago. Uh, so the, the hardware design, like I've been saying, uh, first thing I did was start Git repository, so everything's version controlled. Great thing about KiCad is the, the board files and everything are plain text, they're not binary, uh, so the I mean, the Git logs don't get excessively long very quickly, this kind of thing. Um, so the schematic and PCB are all done in KiCad. So you, you draw your schematic first, you can then export that to the PCB editor and build up the same board, and that will generate industry standard Gerber files, which I sent off to China, got the PCBs made, um, came back with the spot on for the time, no problems with manufacture. Uh, and it spits out CSV files and components which I put into LibreOffice and, and we've kind of sorted it all out, put final codes next to it, all the parts. Um, and then I hand assembled it. Um, I've got liquid flux and things, but uh, it's not, it only took uh, maybe five minutes to solve the surface mount chip, so it's not excessively difficult work. Um, so the software compiling for the ARM Cortex is pretty well documented. There's a, a GitHub uh, repository with a bash script which says summon ARM toolchain which builds an open source GCC targeting the Cortex M3 microcontroller. Um, the, the most important thing about this is that the, there's this project called Lib Open CM3. It was called Lib Open STM32 because it was only supporting the STM32, but it now supports uh, NXP and Atmel and other ARM Cortex parts. But it's a hardware layer, abstraction layer library, which does things like you can do GPIO set, which just toggles a GPIO pin on and off. Um, and these kind of functions, and the, specifically the headers that tell you where all the registers are in the chip and things, normally those libraries have a proprietary license on them, and they're copyright the manufacturer of the chip or the manufacturer of the tool chain. LibOpenSDM, uh, LibOpenCM3 is a completely open source GPL, it's LGPL actually, in case you want to include it into a, a proprietary firmware for something, but it's the, you can do what you like with it. There's no um, no proprietary licensing or anything on the um, LibOpenCM3 library, so that the low-level hardware is, is open as well. Um, new C library is maintained by Red Hat. It's the 
kind of the minimal C library that you need to get along, do string manipulation and stand by and this kind of thing. Um, and the programming on this uh, chip is done with a, an open source bootloader called STM32 Flash. So if you've done Arduino stuff, you've probably come across the uh, FTDI serial adapter, five, uh, six pin serial adapter lead. That's what I use for programming this. There's no chip requirement for JTAG hardware, nothing like a lot of other ARM products. You can just plug this serial lead in, program it with free software, and you know, it's a pound or something, it's just 30 pounds something for a, a JTAG device. So, um, if you come and have a look at the hardware sometime later, you'll realise there's, there's bodged on bits and piles of hot melt glue and things. And I found that there are some mechanical issues with the parts that I'd, I'd spec'd up based on what they look like in a photo on, on the website catalogue. And when they arrived, I realised they were about five times smaller than I thought they were. Surface mount switches and, and they're just not standing up to the, to the strain. So, mm -hmm. It really needs um, an up, up issue of the board with, with more mechanically resilient switches. Uh, there's a couple of other things I've, I've tweaked in the power chain as I've been building. Um, but the software is taking shape. As you heard, it played a, played a track there. I've got some scheduling issues with the, with the multi-threading um, in a microcontroller, which is um, quite a challenge, but it's getting there. Um, and the idea is to have this kind of low level stuff sorted out and then if someone else wants to do a, a game for it or something it's, um, as you saw, it's got the four buttons at one end and the two at the other end so you can kind of hold it in a game controller fashion as well as the idea or any kind of high level stuff the idea is that there'll be library calls to access the hardware and you can, you can develop with minimal knowledge of what the, what the low level stuff does. Um, it's, it's a good example project if you want to see what a fairly complex KiCad project looks like. Um, you can download it and open it. I've got 3D models for a lot of the chips and things. I found some errors in the placement of the parts where I overlap the bodies but not the pins of things by using the 3D viewing KiCad and all this kind of stuff. So it's quite uh, quite a complete project. It's got all the mechanical layout and, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and what probably my best reason for making it is I'm due to finish my PhD shortly and I'll be looking for a job. And a PhD doesn't tell anyone about your practical engineering ability. So this will be my CV. So uh, thank you for listening. And are there any questions? <coughs> yeah, that's amazing. <coughs> wow, good, good work. I have one. Um, given that there's basically no alternative to um, an iPod that's of a reasonable size and um, price point, yeah. are, are you thinking of, of taking it through to a, a larger storage mechanism? Because basically, you know, an iPod Classic with 120 gigs, a lot of people can fit their entire music library together, yeah. right? um, but there's nothing like that, that supports a decent, you know, decent format and isn't. Yeah, right. Um, I have not considered changing the storage medium. I mean, a 32 gig SD card is 20 quid. Or something. Yeah, 32 gig is quite a bit. I mean, um, it should be SDX compatible as well. So 64 and 128 gig cards, mm -hmm. which will be making more you know, more affordable price points in the next year or two. So, it's really easy to access an SD card, mm -hmm. um, and they're really, really cheap. Which is why you see phone yeah. manufacturers and stuff are actually soldering SD cards onto the mainboard instead of mm -hmm. using flash chips, just because they're produced in such volume and they're cheaper. Um, so I don't think I'll be changing the storage medium. Um, the sheer number of pins to access anything else because SD is serial, you can do it with four pins. Whereas, say, going for a, an IDE interface or, or something, you need uh, 16 to 18 pins or something. It's just not, not practical in this size. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, I noticed you've got two tracks. So you've got what, stereo record and stereo output. That's right. Yeah. Um, did you look at what it would take to go multi-track for people who are kind of solo gigging musicians, give them a um, soft mixer, that kind of thing? Give them it's four in, four out. I don't know. It's not within the capabilities of this one codec chip. It's too small. Yeah. The the codec chip includes the ADCs, the DACs, the uh, all the audio amplifiers and pre-amplifiers, there's there are no active audio components outside that one chip. So if you have two chips, you could do so four in four out. Precisely, you could, yes. And and you can there you can put them on SPI buses. If you want to play with the chip, um, it's the chip that's used on the Arduino MP3 shield, uh, or you can get it as a separate breakout board from Spark. But it's um, the chip is quite widely used in the kind of open source projects as well. Yep. How much do the entire bit of materials cost from somewhere like Fargo? Um, I think it was about £100, but I've now got enough resistors to build about 25, 50 of them, because you can only buy them in 50 off because they're, they're tiny surface mount resistors. Um, so the, the and I've got enough PCBs to build 10. So the PCBs are about $3 each from China, even in 10 off quantities, not large quantities. Um, the, the single most expensive component is the screen, which is about £13 in a one-off. Um, it's a black and white, green backlit um, LCD, so it draws next to no current, which was what I was going for, really, because I didn't want to watch video on my music player. Um, and I want to do on battery life. Uh, but it's, yeah, that's the most expensive. And then the codec chip is about £15 in a while. Uh, that drops dramatically if you buy more than 250 at a time. But it's a lot easier than doing live for this yourself. And, and that kind of thing. I think time's up. Yeah. Is that okay? Not yet. We need to. If anyone wants a I've got some business cards with a QR code and an address if you're interested in more details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.